Thank you, William and Eric. I'm really sorry about that mix up. Vacation cannot come soon enough. <laughs> Thank you. This works, obviously. <laughs> obviously. I'm really sorry. Um, okay. So we do have a quorum. We have four members, Eric, William, Martha, and Ben, and we have applicants slash project representatives. All right, whenever you're ready, Ben. You're ready? Great. Uh, all right, I'll call to order the July 15th, 2024 meeting of the Design Review Committee. Uh, I'll let members, of, members and staff introduce themselves. Martha Smirsky, member. Benjamin Cheney, yeah, member. William Russell, member. Benjamin Cheney, member. Meredith Crandall, staff. Um, I'll let, at this time, I'll let Meredith uh, provide an overview of the remote meeting procedures and process. I will try and keep this very brief because our only, oh, here's Liz. Uh, our only remote attendees right now are committee members. Okay, so there we go. All right, so for anyone attending tonight's um, design review committee meeting via Orca Media or watching the meeting, um, you can participate in the discussion via the Zoom platform through either video or telephone access options. Um, you can either type this link into your web browser and I'll get a notification that you want to come into the meeting or you can dial this phone number here and when prompted put in this meeting ID um, and again I'll get a little notice that you want to get into the meeting. If anyone is trying either of these options and is having problems please email me at mcrandall at montpelier-vt.org. I will be monitoring my email throughout the meeting. Um, for anyone who does attend via Zoom, turning your video on is optional. We do ask that you keep your microphone on mute when you're not speaking. This will help reduce background noise. Um, and finally, please reserve the Zoom chat function for troubleshooting or logistics questions only. Um, any substantive questions or comments should be made by raising your hand and waiting for the chair to call on you. Um, in the event the public is unable to access tonight's meeting, it will need to be continued to a time and place certain. Thank you. And I'll hand the meeting back over to the chair. All right. Do I see a motion? Do I have a motion to approve the agenda? This is Martha. I'll make a motion Rose. to approve. One of them seconded, it yeah, seems I'll like. Yeah, I'll have Eric second. <laughs> uh, uh, I have no comments. Oh, you got a vote. Oh, sure. <laughs> do we? Uh, <laughs> is there a vote to uh, begin the meeting? I move to um, Wait, we have I say meeting. yes. Let's let's go. Uh, move, move to begin the meeting, <laughs> accept the, the agenda, whatever we need. <laughs> That's a yes. That's a yes. It's <laughs> great. Uh, yep. we have Liz on too now. So Liz and William. Yeah. 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 Yes, I, I agree. Start the meeting. Here we go. Um so we have four Langdon Street, uh revised parklet for Bent Nails Bistro. You want to come tell us all about it, Joe? Sure. Is this working all right? Yep. Okay. Yeah, don't touch any buttons. No, I don't <laughs> touch any of that stuff. Awesome. Um, so there's a, thanks to Meredith, the email included from Corey yep. discussing, since we couldn't put it on the bridge, there's a couple of pictures there. So essentially we'll be covering up the triangular painted area right in front of four langdon street and that leaves acceptable distance to the sidewalk according to him so structures totally different this can be a wood frame deck pressure treated decking uh flush to the curb for at least 36 inches so we don't have to deal with any ramps or whatever and then back to the decorative metal railing and canopy system similar to what we were proposing before essentially the same thing just much shorter so it's eight by 19 feet is the space that we have there. And um, that's essentially it. I mean, and it's per his 
email. It's not on a trailer. It's just a framed uh, wooden deck. Yeah, because the trailer that we had, like, the, it's impossible to put it there. The sidewalk sloped pretty steep there, so there's no way to get a ramp and make room for all that stuff. Yep. The trailer was a cool idea, we thought, in the beginning, because at the end of the season, we can just hook on it and take it away and store it, but that's not worth it anymore. Right. <laughs> it's too much trouble. And how could does you, it get there? Could how you point out the picture where the, de where the deck is going? Uh, yeah, it's going to go... It's going to go starting about here to about where the end of that triangle space is, right, Joe? Yeah, exactly. Yep. So it's going to be about about the length of a parking space versus before it was going to be two. And you're just going to like cover the sidewalk. Nope, it's going to be on the, in the street, and okay. level with level with the sidewalk okay. because they have okay. to make sure that it's um, accessible. Joe, remind me about how long you expect this parklet to be in place. It'll be 8 by 19 feet is what we have for room. And that's right to the end of that white pane is what I measured before our last meeting. And that leaves us 20 feet plus that Corey's okay with to the sidewalk per state standards. My question was more toward the length of time that you expect to leave it there. It's not a permanent front. No, I, I think there's an established season for parklets, right? So we would okay. like bring it in and uh, whenever that is and take it out when we have to take it out. Yep, they're allowed to be through October 31st. It's on the um, application form on the second page, okay. but that's also just, it's by the, the ordinance. So they're permitted from April 15th through October 31st. Okay. It okay. has to do with the plowing, yep. the typical plowing season. And both entrance and exit onto this thing is through that 36 inch wide entrance and that's kind yep. of the only way you get on and off this yeah thing. that was um so this picture here is a little bit deceptive that that sidewalk has quite a bit of slope to it yeah the bridge has slope to it itself yeah that yeah. one shows it a little better so yeah uh, it's gonna have to be it's gonna be tricky even to get it um within ADA standards for 36 inches because the whole thing is on a slope and the deck, I was informed, has to be, I mean, we can only have like a quarter of an inch of out of level in the 19 feet. So um, I think we have just enough. The further it comes towards Elm Street, the steeper the street gets. So it makes sense to have that <coughs> yep. entry exit on the uphill side. That's more level than um, the Elm Street side. And the, I assume you run this by Public Works, right? Uh, as far as the placement of it, yeah, Corey said uh, as long as we maintain that 20 feet to the sidewalk, that meets uh, the state standards, and he's all right with that. And asked for right. restrictions on not blocking the sidewalk with loading and unloading, but we don't. We don't load or unload on Langdon anyway. That goes through the Elm Street door. Oh, the reason I asked is that Langdon Street is sometimes pretty jammed up, just normal traffic. There's actually, if you look at this picture that's displayed right now, so that this end of Langdon Street flares way wide when it hits Elm Street to allow for turning in both directions. Um, that was also in the email to Corey. There's going to be, there'll still be 26 feet of clearance from the edge of the parklet to the curb on the opposite side towards State Street. Um, and he was fine with that as well. Thank you. How many tables do you anticipate on the parklet? Um, haven't really figured it out but I would say three to four loose tables probably like three so we're gonna in the design I don't know how clear it is it's really clear to me because I engineer in my head as I go um, on the site plan pair sorry I'm trying to find it here on the plan view so that you can see a skinnier rail cap on the sidewalk side Yep. So that's going to be at like 42 inch railing height. 
and we were thinking that that would be the where the tables would be placed close to that railing so they could be actually served from the sidewalk <coughs> and then these slightly wider ones on the other two side would be also in place built into the railing system but we would have those would be at 42 inch and have like bar stools around um, on those two sides for people to be able to sit and set their stuff down on that slightly wider I wouldn't really call it tabletop it'll probably be like 12 Counter. or 12 or 16 inches or something and there, there are railings that go all the way around except for the little gateway yep exactly and the curved sunshade is on the the sidewalk side Langdon I mean uh, yeah Langdon Street side it's on the Langdon Street yep. side because that's where it, in the, the afternoon sun comes in that direction yeah so, so side <laughs> yeah sidewalk here yep and then the one inch square tubing basically yep. completes the rectangle all the way around to be able to be rafters for the sunshade exactly. as well as yeah i'm going to have a center support and then we added that <clears throat> like the full structure so in order if if we deemed it depending on the length of the sunshade it may come a little further than i drew it in here with the magic marker on the top um didn't do it exactly to scale but that's you know three and a half or four feet um my idea is the lower part of the sunshade will be above people's line of sight so it won't be you won't be looking through it yep and then is the are you going to paint the steel or are you going to leave the steel to rust We're or are you planning to leave it raw actually yep. and let it just do its thing yep and then what sort of uh, like wood cap, like for your countertop and wood cap? I'm actually, I'm not 100% decided on it yet, but I just sawed up some live edge cherry and ash this summer. And I was thinking we might use that for these, possibly not for the narrow cap. We might just do something straight there, like yep. a PT two by eight or something. but. For the wider ones, I'm kind of hoping to work that because we have live edge bars inside the building too, so it kind of fits there. Yep. Thing. Yep. yep. And the decking is also PT. Yeah. And there's no, I guess there's no uh, density requirement for the railing because it's below 30 inches. I'm thinking about like stuff going into traffic. Like yeah, we'll normally have there's a, a four inch opening that. We'll have enough. So we don't have to comply with the four inch spacing, but we will. I mean, this is like we discussed before. This is just a rough kind of. Yeah. Um, we're going to do it as we go, but we're definitely going to make it so that little kids can't sneak out into the street and get right. run over. You know, I mean, I'm going to. Yeah. I don't even know if we have any jurisdiction or legislation over that. But yeah. I did. Michelle had emailed me in their prior design with the trailer deck and said that if it was going to be above 30 inches, we had to have that spacing. Right. But if right. it's not, technically, we don't even need a railing. So, but. Obviously, we won't. Obviously, for practical purposes. Right. Some somebody trips or you yeah. know steps out into traffic. Right. Yeah. And unexpectedly. It makes for places for people to set their yeah. stuff down, which is important to, yep. for us. Yep. Okay. Just a little side thought. I don't know if your if the liquor license might have requirements for the spacing there too might be worth just double checking with i know that with um other outdoor you know outdoor areas just for control so that mm -hmm. might give you a, a minimum size issue too uh, it would be different from michelle's for the building code but right 
just d worth double checking with them. Liquor department's getting involved in how we build stuff now. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> the, the outdoor service. Right. The outdoor service area. I know that um, um, Charlie O's had to make some tweaks to their sort of outdoor area. Yeah, I, I know we do have, so we do have the outdoor, because Langdon is, yep. you know, barricaded off at times, so we do have the outdoor yeah. thing. So just double and, check and with them. we know of some of the restrictions, but not in particular yeah. for a park. Yeah, I don't, I don't know the particulars, but it, it doesn't idea. hurt to just double check with them. Yes. Yeah, I think it has to do with why it was different for Charlie, it has to do with whether your drinks are being brought to you by a server or whether you as an individual get your drink and walk out. I know you yeah, don't know. Yeah, and, and that's, I don't, and I don't know exactly. It sounded like this might have been, be a mix. Right. So. Yep. Um, yeah, I don't think we're allowed to, customers think, won't be able to carry alcohol across the yeah. sidewalk to get on the park. Yep. Right. But, that's, that's. But you'll be bringing, anyway, just a. just doesn't hurt to double check. That's all I thought. Because right. I know it's not something that's mentioned in the parklet application process mm -hmm. i don't think they threw that no. in yeah. um as one of the things that the city manager has to consider so right. <laughs> i don't want them to approve something that you set it up and then suddenly <laughs> get in trouble with the state that would be bad <coughs> any other comments questions no i'm fine no i have a just a couple um you know one, this this seems like to be a great thing and well situated because you know there's oftentimes I'm coming home late from work and you'll be the only institution open and uh, the you'll be in the only place playing music and where when the summertime when that when that window's open that'll be a great spot to also expand the seating and and patronage out out there. Do you for the because you're open later than other other places do you have do you know that the that the um that the lights the solar lights that you're proposing will have enough capacity to keep lit you know in, at a usable level into the later into the night i think so we have um done that and i'm not the lighting expert so that's carice couldn't be here she's out of town um but we've had a couple of events down there and there have been, they're just simple solar string lights that have been on the bridge um, in the past. And in my opinion, that works well. I don't see where it would be at all unsafe. And we have outdoor lighting on the building, which is gonna be roughly eight feet from the parklet. So I think without any additional lighting, it's, it's, it would be pretty well lit just to sit it there. I'm not sure if there's any city lighting there or not, but it's, um, that's where people step outside of Bent Nails and go across Langdon to smoke, and every time, I'm a smoker, every time I've gone out there, I've never felt like it was dark outside. I don't know, you know, we have our lights, but the city may have a street light there as well. Do you want me to do a quick share screen of just the Google Street View? Sure. Um, so... Bent Nails has their lights. There's lights here at the entrance and then at the windows. Also on and the corner up yep, here. Yep, there's one here at the sign. And then the um, sheriff's parking has a, a street light there across the street. Um, I don't know if there's one... Yep, and there's one here on the other side of Elm. So there's quite a few lights yeah. in the area. Yeah, this, it looks like the like the ones on the building are likely to provide adequate ambient lighting. You know, yeah. you know, maybe a candle on the at the table might be sufficient for any anything yeah. additional. I mean, for our type of establishment, we don't want uh, floodlights on the deck for people to be hanging out doing their thing. So, but we certainly don't want it so dark that people are tripping on stuff as well you know so we can just add more we have plenty of framework in this new design to have 60 or 80 feet of solar string lights and the solar thing is just because we don't want to get into trying to run power and tie it into the building and all that for obvious reasons and 
and then the, the other question is just a procedural one in terms of um, you know how in terms of approving something that is you know that, that where you say that there's a lot of kind of figuring out as you as you go like I mean maybe this is a question for you Meredith or someone who's been on the board longer like how, how do we um, how is there any do we have any contingencies or concerns about that? Uh, well, Meredith and I just discussed that prior to the beginning of this meeting, uh, feeling some of those similar concerns that uh, this is a, as a creative project, the, the drawings don't necessarily reflect all the details and therefore creates a little bit of an awkward precedent for us going forward as to how we might um, defend our decision around this. That said, it is not a permanent thing. It is a parklet that comes and goes. Um, and the we kind of reviewed the language around it. And it isn't necessarily required to have um, all these drawings um, as well detailed as we might be accustomed to. Um, gives us room to sort of ask for more information or sort of, you know, kind of work with the uh, applicant to be able to make these decisions. I, too, feel a little concerned about the, um, the amount of creativity that is going to go into this that we don't necessarily know what's going to happen. That said, I also am excited for uh, something like this to happen in, in town and believe that it not being a permanent structure, there's a little bit more flexibility on that subject. Yeah. So the other thing to keep in mind is this is not a zoning permit. Um, it's a parklet permit that the city manager is going to be issuing. Um, it's good for a set number of, I think for a set number of years, and then it has to go back through a reapproval through the city manager. And if anything um, really changes during that approval process, it gets put back through the full review. Um, and it's you know, it's coming to the design review committee because city council and staff, you know, said, you know, we really want to make sure that design review still has a part in this, but it's not a permanent structure. It's not attaching to any of the buildings. Um, and so this is, this is sort of a hybrid, -y, hy hybrid approval where you guys are giving your input and it's not actually going to me. I ferry it through to the city manager and the city manager brings all these different, um, um, you know, comments into play when, before the city manager makes the decision. Um, it does this particular one, um, and most of the, the parklets in the city do need um, flood hazard permits, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't actually need a zoning permit because it's in the public right of way. So I might add one thing. Um, I said it at the last meeting, but I don't think you were in attendance. So the reason for leaving this open window of flexibility is because Aaron and I intend to fabricate this decorative railing system ourselves, and I'm a excellent fabricator, but I'm not an artist. So <laughs> it's everything that he has done. I've never seen anything anybody have any offense to any of that that he has in and around the establishment and I'm sure we're not going to build something that anyone is going to think is other than cool. Um, and I mean we could certainly if we I could submit something to one of you guys when we kind of get to that point if we needed to, but essentially that's, it's just the pattern of how we're going to wrap this thing with the rebar stuff that's not drawn accurately on the drawing. Yep. So it's, it's not a permanent structure. Uh, it goes away and it gets back for review. I'm not really concerned. We could we could ask ourselves a question: How bad can they screw it up and see? <laughs> <clears throat> I agree, Eric. It's Liz. And if so, how long will it be bad? <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, my fears are not that it's going to be bad. I don't actually have that. My fears are more just precedent for us making decisions that we can defend based on uh, information provided. I think, Ben, I think that's a good thought. Uh, and I think it kind of depends on, you know, what the project is and, you know, what the consequences of a mistake is. Right, and in this in this scenario, feels like the consequences are fairly low for a mistake. I, I would think so, and you know it's pretty standard structural structure, kind of a structure, you know, treated deck with square metal posts or railing and a cap on the railing. Yeah, I I certainly don't imagine this is going to be this particular case is going to be an issue. Just in, if anyone in the future says, well, how come I need all, all of this when they don't just have to be able to say that, you know, justify it in, 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 this, in this way. Yep, exactly. And I, I feel like we do have that justification, but I, uh, and I am thankful Joe put a little bit more effort into this than what we saw last time. Uh, so it feels like, I feel like I have the information I can make a decision with. I'm, I'm comfortable with the information, even though it's minimal. But it covers the essentials. You know, how high the railing is going to be within a range, what the materials are going to be, where the gates and fence are going to be. Any other comments? Um, do we have to make a motion or we just vote? Uh, you need to go through your recommendation oh, form, right? We get to go through this first. Yeah. Right. Four might I, be applicable. I had one, um, oh. just one comment. Yeah. Um, you know, I was wondering if they would might have the railing design available for our next meeting or is, is that not something that seems reasonable? I don't think uh, we'll have it that soon. It's kind of a okay. thing that we're, um, I'm not really sure we're going to, because the season is getting shorter now, I mean, depending on how long it takes to finalize this process, we may not actually place this paraclip for this season because we have till October 15th, so we'll have to see how long the process takes. We may start construction in the meantime, but not mobilize it till next spring. Okay. Okay, thank you. I, I think, and you know, in following up on Liz, I think, you know, if the were uh, available, it's kind of an advisory thing. Uh, anytime you need it. Okay. At yeah. At a regular meeting. I mean, so I don't know if you can tell from the drawings, but essentially, we're just gonna have. Uh, a fairly small gauge rebar as like the containment system to you know just mostly for safety but also something that looks a little different and cool it's just a matter of like the placement of that on the railing that I think is not going to happen until we are there to look at it together and see what looks the best and that's Aaron's input because he's an artist and I'm not. It would all be square if it was up to me. <laughs> <clears throat> all right. Uh, well, so the areas that this seems to apply to is um, not applicable for historic structure, uh, it's not applicable for new construction, it's seasonal. Uh, uh, existing buildings shall be recognized N seems not applicable proposed landscaping none is a pot proposed location and appearance of all utilities no utilities oh wait there is well, fencing. It's ah. sort of, it's, that one sort of applies because we're sort of talking about fencing in the railings yeah. that's what you're thinking it's a little weird because it's is it fencing or is it railing it's a little of both we're fencing in humans so we can't <laughs> right. get yeah. away with their alcohol. <laughs> uh, 
I would call that call what this railing is acceptable um, if you do come to a moment when you feel like you can share with us what it looks like we would yep. love to see that yep. um, there are no alterations to the building uh, let's see it's, can't mm, respect a views to the state house not applicable uh, Parcels with both river frontage and development shall be oriented to both the river and street facades. Uh, our primary, not applicable. Height, it's not very tall, not <laughs> applicable. Proportion, seems to fit within its, uh, where it's, the city says it is, but it's not necessarily in, in comparison to a building, not applicable. Rhythm, uh, again, not there's no windows or doors so not applicable uh roof shape and equipment um there's no roof no equipment not applicable uh architectural features architectural features including but not limited to cornice windows shutters f fan lights tablature trim and other forms of molding or character defining detailing prevailing on the existing building shall be considered in the alteration of the building. This was the one, the new construction about how, making sure new things reflect the existing in the area. That's the only thing there that I was thinking might, might be something you guys would consider for that criteria. But, you know, features on the surrounding area. It's usually for new buildings. This isn't a new building, but just it really whether or not it fits in with the area is kind of what it's saying. I mean, I think it certainly fits in with the business that's established there. So I'm going to go acceptable. Uh, roof drain systems, no roof, not applicable. Uh, signage removal, there's no sign to remove, not applicable. Outdoor lighting and fixtures, the structural design or outdoor lighting fixtures shall be compatible with architectural design and function of the building and compatible with the neighborhood. Um, I think your strip light idea on the underside is certainly acceptable. Um, landscaping and screening and site furnishings, projects within the design review overlay district shall be subject to the landscaping requirements in section 3203 shall consider the following. Site furnishings including fencing, seating, and other types of site furni furniture visible from the street or side yards. Does landscaping obscure or undermine key architectural patterns or elements on historic buildings? Mechanical and equipment screening. Um, I took a look at all the chairs and stools that you had proposed. They seem totally adequate. Um, I assume others did too, but they're nothing out of the ordinary. Uh, this is not a built new building, so nothing is required there. Scale and massing, not applicable. So this is all new building stuff. Oh, that's all. That's the only one that might apply is that accessory buildings and structures. It's kind of a, this is a new temporary seasonal accessory structure. So that criteria 22 on the list is the only thing that might be something to consider. New accessory buildings or structures shall be located within either the side yard or rear yard and shall not visually disrupt the streetscape or affect the integrity of the existing building or proposed new building. I don't think I, I don't, this is applicable because it's, it's not, it doesn't fit within a side or rear yard. Yeah, it's a little, it's a weird one where, I mean, I mean, somebody could maybe propose some really crazy huge parklet um, that was really tall and could impact how you're seeing some, you know, next you know some building right next door um that's one of the reasons that planning really insisted that design review still apply but in general it's hard to fit that one in the side yard there is a little bit damp <laughs> <laughs> i marked it as not applicable i i do want to go back to the architectural elements and just you know for the record state that i think that the the shade cloth is a good color that will not be you know, it won't um, it's not going to be really distracting 
because that's going to be a long line when you see it from a distance coming down the street. And I think that the lighter color is really, it's really, it's really appropriate. Yeah, we don't, we don't want a darker color because the, the darker sunshades absorb heat and then radiate it to the occupants on the other side. So I voted for white, but I think tan is a little classier than white. White just is more functional. The tan, I think, yeah, either would fit, I think, with the paint scheme from the for the building. And it doesn't distract from the dark paint of the bridge right next to it. Perfect. You could meet in the middle and have stripes. <laughs> <laughs> they do make about 14 different colors, so we could just get narrower strips. <clears throat> Big plaid. Do we make a motion? I'm going to vote yeah, that one down. Right. Uh, do I hear a motion to uh, accept, to wait, to, approve, to, approve to approve the application? So moved, says Eric. Any seconds? This is Martha. I say second. Uh, people would like to vote? Says Martha. Eric says yes. Martha says yes. William says yes. Liz? Yes, I, thought I said, you didn't hear me. Sorry. I say yes. That's okay. Yeah, and Ben says yes. Awesome. Project is uh, approved. So if you Thank can you. record the vote on the bottom of the back sheet of that. Bottom of the back sheet. Your name. Yep, so. Vote. vote. Right, vote is four to zero? Five. Five to zero. Five, Five to zero, Well yes. done. And then sign and date. Great. And then I'll have you sign under Ben's signature on here. And I will package this all up. And uh, eventually they'll get recycled. Keep one. If you can sign right here, Joe. Yeah. Um, and I'll make sure to include the, um, I didn't include it in here, but the image of the solar string lights that you had in too. Okay. Um, no. Nope, I got it. Um, and I'll package this all up and send it on to the city manager's office with everybody else copied. I'll try and pull everything in. Um, you, we will need to do a river hazard permit um, just because, but it's going to be a simple one. So I will get you that paperwork too. Yay, more paper. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye, you. Thanks a lot. I assume you're here regarding the bridge, and which is not on our agenda, but that's okay. It's, yeah, I'd already gotten it all published on the website, so it'll be Perfect. under other business. You can do minutes first if you want. No, or let's do, do this. Them. Okay. Come on up. <laughs> Please. Yes. And make sure if you speak, you speak into the microphone. Okay. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Vivian Ladd Tomasi, and I'm here representing Montpelier Alive and Montpelier Alive's Bridge Illumination Project. Um, I'm not sure to what extent you're aware of this project or where you want me to begin. Zero. We're aware of zero. Oh, okay. Right. Then <laughs> well, I will. <almost laughs> I gave, gave people pa these packets who showed up. Um, and yeah, give, give your presentation and I can show things. Um, okay, well, starting at the beginning, um, I came uh, on staff at, the, at Montpelier Live um, uh, in 2023, and um, I had been thinking for a long time that Montpelier, which was founded, as we all know, at the confluence of four rivers, um, is a city of bridges. There are actually 23 highway, railroad, pedestrian, vehicular bridges in this town and um, they are um, I think an underutilized resource and I had thought for a long time that lighting the bridges would transform Montpelier cityscape. 
I apparently was not alone in that thought. Um, a lot of people have thought about illuminating Montpelier's bridges. And so in 2023, I worked with Montpelier Alive um, to explore the feasibility of the project. Um, I've been working with historians, local historians, to get to know the significance and histories behind the bridges. Um, we have worked with a local uh, professional lighting company, the lighting company that's responsible for the Shelburne Museum's Winter Lights show, um, to talk about the project and what we needed um, in terms of infrastructure, what the costs might be. Um, and last year, we decided uh, as a pilot project to light the Langdon Street Bridge, and many of you may have seen that installation. Um, So through that year's worth of research, um, we determined that there was great potential here. After the flood in July of 2023, Langdon Street was really languishing. It was very dark. That street is historically dark. And many people assumed that it was closed and nothing was open for business there because it presented as very dark. And once we lit that bridge, that that um, part of town was transformed. And we heard over and over again from business owners on that street that that bridge really saved them um, after the flood that winter. And that it became kind of a beacon for holiday shopping. Um, it is the sort of center of nightlife and restaurant, um, there's restaurants and bars and music scene there. And the bridge kind of seemed to kind of proclaim that Langdon Street was open for business and that it was the place to be. We also discovered that um, when the lighting system failed a few weeks early, that electrical infrastructure was gonna be pivotal to this project. So at the end of 2023, we applied for a grant through Better Places. Um, it's a state uh, grant through the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And it was a $40,000 grant to help us install the electrical infrastructure on, um, on several bridges downtown. Uh, our goal was potentially to light in 2024, this year, seven historic bridges. The three bridges downtown, the Rialto, the Langdon Street Bridge, and the School Street Bridge, as well as um, four bridges along the Winooski, the Bailey Avenue Bridge, Taylor Street Bridge, the Main Street Bridge, and the Granite Street Bridge. Um, we. Uh, Part of that grant required us to crowdsource a third of the budget. It was a $40,000 grant, and we met that goal um, almost instantly. It was so fast. The support for the project was so widespread that within a month we had met our crowdsourcing um, goal. And, um, and so that, uh, if we actually can go back one, that funding um, means that uh, we were able to install electrical outlets on Granite Street, Taylor Street, Main Street. Uh, we were able, uh, the city actually repaired the gas lights that sit on Bailey Avenue. This is just a, an image of Montpelier at night. Um, and uh, you can see our city's kind of dark in the winter time. And in particular, all of the connectors from one side of the city to another, from one neighborhood to another, all of those bridges are dark um, for, for many, many months in the winter time. So um, that funding also will allow us to light the bridges right in the center of downtown. If we could go to the next slide. The original concept for the bridge illumination project was to install seasonal temporary lighting. So we would lease the lighting um, systems from the New England Holiday Lighting Company and, and install the lighting in November and then take it down in February in keeping with the 90-day lighting ordinance that exists here in the city of Montpelier. Um, so for 2024, our goal for the Rialto Bridge was to essentially highlight the fact that a river runs through it. Um, many people actually don't notice that there is an entire river running through the city of Montpelier. Maybe that's not true anymore. <laughs> um, but uh, a few years ago, I can't tell you how many people I stopped on Langdon Street and asked them, do you notice that there's a river running through right underneath two lanes of traffic, two sidewalks, and a building in downtown? And people were often surprised by that. So the goal is for the Rialto Bridge. Can we get the next slide? It's not the most attractive bridge, 
but this kind of, um, it really illustrates the connectivity between the city and our watershed, um, the way that it sits over this water. So the idea was to kind of illuminate the space between the Rialto and the river. The next bridge along is the, the Langdon Street Bridge. And, oh, so, Ooh, no. whoops, we'll go, go back one. So, um, yeah, no, you're right, you're right. Um, so for the Rialto Bridge, given the fact that uh, events of last week, we realized, can we go back to that Rialto Street yep. Bridge? Um, rather than trying to light underneath the bridge, it is our goal to avoid the floodway at all costs. Mm -hmm. um, and so now um, it is our hope to actually install um, what we call, um, they're called programmable RGB wash lights, and they would be installed, do you see the wider kind of, um, exactly, those wider panels in between um, the urn-like shapes that form the, the banister of the Rialto Bridge? We would um, install a light in the center of each of those that would actually downwash um, the bridge and kind of reflect off the water. And you can see in the next slide just kind of what that might look like. Um, the idea here is to install programmable lights so that we could potentially change the colors, change the effects. Um, but for uh, the initial winter season, we might do something um, just kind of very tasteful and soft. Sorry, I, I think the theater is do some, doing something really noisy upstairs to get ready for their Got it. show. <laughs> I see, I see. So in any case, so down washing the Rialto Bridge is the first iteration. Then a little further along, uh, the Langdon Street Bridge, once again, we want to light it um, similar to how we lit it um, in 2023, except that um, in addition to, the Langdon Street Bridge is essentially wrapped with Christmas lights again, thinking that it was a temporary installation. Um, if we think about it um, as a more long-term installation, we are also thinking of wrapping it with a set of, again, programmable lights where we can change the colors um, in conjunction with different events taking place in the city. The next bridge we'd like to light is the School Street Bridge, um, which is the next slide. In uh, 1927, both the Langdon Street Bridge and the School Street Bridge were um, destroyed in the flood, and they were replaced at the same time. So they're kind of sister bridges. They're both pony trust bridges. And since School Street is a little bit more uh, residential, our thought was to create, uh, to, to design the lighting here so that it would echo the Langdon Street Bridge, but in a much softer and quieter way. Throughout this project, our goal is to light these bridges. The design for the lighting of each bridge is designed to um, either amplify its function or to uh, draw attention to its design or engineering or its role within the city. And the, um, in addition to thinking about the bridges individually, we're also thinking about how the bridges kind of talk to one another in space. Um, so have dialogue with one another. So here where we have these two sister bridges, we want to kind of point out that similarity, but also respect the fact that School Street is in a quieter area. On the Winooski, the Main Street Bridge is a, um, it's a continuous, um, I always forget the phrase for this, uh, it's a pretty um, utilitarian, it's a continuous steel beam bridge. It's pretty utilitarian. It doesn't have a lot of architectural um, panache, but um, we're gonna take advantage of the structure of this bridge. In the next slide, you'll see that the railings are made up of many, many, many um, vertical um, metal pipes. And so the plan is here to attach a wash lighting system on the outside of the railing that will reflect on all of those vertical posts. And it will create essentially two arcs of light that if you think about in terms of like vanishing points or perspective will actually draw the eye into downtown Montpelier, essentially ushering people into downtown. Um, and Main Street is really our, you know, the central artery into the downtown area. 
So I just have a picture here to kind of show what like wash lighting looks like in succession, especially the slide on the left. You can see that light reflecting on those vertical um, posts. And once again, this is programmable lighting, so it can the colors can change with the seasons in conjunction with events happening in downtown Montpelier. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, moving along the Winooski, um, Bailey Avenue is actually very similar to Main Street, except that it does have a series of decorative lampposts that are identical to those in downtown Montpelier. So in this uh, winter, we are only planning to wrap those light posts with um, garlands that are wrapped in lights, just as we do downtown throughout the downtown area. But perhaps next year, we might install that same kind of wash lighting system um, outside the railings um, to provide that same kind of um, programmable lighting system. Finally, the, the final two bridges that we are talking about here um, are the Taylor Street Bridge and the Granite Street Bridge. And these are really the jewels in the bridge illumination crown, these kind of monumental truss bridges. So Taylor Street, um, for our first iteration this, um, this winter, the idea is actually to line the trusses and to accentuate the Parker through truss design with strings of C9 Christmas lights. And C9 Christmas lights are the big, the big lights that everybody knows from their childhood. They're kind of like the big, um, I don't know how you pronounce it. You, they're kind of candle shaped. Um, and they'd be attached with magnets. So they won't affect the structure in any way. They can be installed and then taken down. And so this heavy industrial structure will actually be transformed into something very lacy and ethereal. And I found a slide of a bridge elsewhere in the world with a similar kind of treatment. It will not be anywhere near as dense as this. Mm -hmm. But just to give you a sense of that kind of lacy effect that that kind of lighting will achieve. But our ultimate goal is to install permanent lighting on both the Taylor and the Granite Street Bridge that's more like this. And this kind of lighting is, um, is actually programmable RGB track lighting. And um, the track lighting has tremendous versatility. It can be any color. You can change the color within, um, within the track. As you can see here, part of the track is red, part of it is blue, part of it is white. It can generate effects. But this type of lighting has to be attached uh, in a very durable and rather permanent way. Of course, nothing is permanent, but this track lighting is attached with um, a commercial grade adhesive. And so, um, it is a little bit difficult to remove. If you do remove it, it probably would pull off the paint, but the track lighting comes with a 20 year warranty. So the idea here is to do something that really would be permanent and that would last. If those bridges need to be painted in the future, that's not a problem. The lighting can be um, taken out and the tracks can be painted the same color as the bridge. Um, and then the lighting can be reinstalled. So I just wanted to give you a sense that Granite Street Bridge is next. Um, oh, actually, to just give you a sense of that track lighting, the track lighting is about two inches wide, and it's about an inch tall, and it comes in black and brown and white. Unfortunately, it does not come in industrial green, um, but this is kind of what it looks like. So that's the larger kind of scope of this project. Um, but we actually have sort of two installations that we're talking about right now. And I'm here today, A, just share the project with you, but also to get your um, feedback, uh, to kind of um, your advice. Um, in addition to the Better Places grant, we, we have raised money from local, um, uh, from local donors. We also have a pending fa uh, grant before the Vermont Arts Council. Uh, the um, Montpelier Arts Commission has pledged funding to this project. 
And uh, in late June, we were given an opportunity through the Department of Tourism to apply for a $150,000 grant to support this project. And um, that grant required that we think about this lighting a little bit differently. We had been thinking of 2024 as the year when we would install temporary seasonal lighting from November to February that would be installed in November, taken down in February to give the city a chance to see if they like the lighting, if there's support behind the project, um, to give us a chance to see what's really impactful, uh, what maybe is less necessary. But this grant opportunity came along um, and it really required us to think about the installation in a more permanent, um, in a more permanent way and to think about the bridges as a way of marketing Montpelier as a destination. And so we started thinking about bridge lighting not only as a seasonal event, but perhaps as a way to amplify everything that Montpelier does. So perhaps for a couple of days in February, the bridges go pink for Valentine's Day. Perhaps in June, for a short period of time, the bridges are rainbow uh, to celebrate Pride Month. Um, perhaps um, for July 3rd, for a couple of days, they go red, white, and blue. So that Montpelier becomes a place that's really exciting visually all year round. We're not talking about lighting the bridges 365 days a year. Um, all of the lighting will be on a timer so that the bridges are only lit when there's activity downtown. We want to respect the fact that people love dark night skies and they like to sleep in the darkness. And we also want to respect the natural world and animals and creatures that need dark, um, dark skies. Um, but we also think that there's great potential in this project to really transform Montpelier cityscape into something really dynamic and exciting through um, the artful installation of lighting. And these bridges can be a kind of a, an armature for light installations that can um, change and grow and kind of respond to what's happening in the city for years to come. So my understanding is that bridges fall into a funny place in terms of zoning and regulation and design review. Um, they're not really buildings, um, and so I don't think there's the same kind of rules around, um, you know, I know when you put a nail in a building, you have to, you have to get permission for that. Um, we really want to be very respectful of these structures. Primarily, this lighting isn't going to impact any of the structures, um, except for three, Taylor, Granite, and the Rialto. So if we go back to the Rialto Bridge, in order to install that down lighting and to do it safely and responsibly, we would need to um, put a few bolts in the sidewall of the Rialto Bridge. There'll be five boxes on each of those wide columns and each of them require two bolts. The bolts are two inches deep and about three eighths of an inch wide. We also would probably need to run a conduit along the bottom edge of the banister to just kind of connect the electrical wires between those, those five boxes. The New England Holiday Light Company is a very professional light company. They work for museums and historic houses. Um, they work clean and neat and um, everything would be um, installed according to safety standards. Um, so that's one um, potential um, impact on a bridge, kind of physical impact. And then there's the issue of the two truss bridges and whether we feel comfortable um, installing a track lighting system with either screws or this commercial grade adhesive. My personal belief is what I would love to do this year, every. For Taylor, for Taylor Street, I would actually love to try the temporary installation for one year because I'd love to see that lacy effect with those C9 Christmas lights. It's not the most efficient way to light the bridge because we have to pay to have the lights installed, then to have them deinstalled, and then if we decide we want to go with the track lighting, to reinstall the track lighting. 
but I would like us this year to install that track lighting perhaps in a more minimal way with maybe a light hand on the Granite Street Bridge so that we could see it and we could um, as a community um, you know have a sense to see what that bridge looks lit and and have a chance to see throughout the year what it's like to change up those lights to change up those colors to animate that bridge and if we do like it then perhaps to commit to doing it as well on the taylor street bridge so just the goals of this project just a couple of things i just want to say the goals of this project are not just to do something pretty in Montpelier. I mean, there is a beautification element here for sure, but it's also um, part of kind of a, a, a larger scale marketing campaign um, on behalf of Montpelier Alive to, to um, bring some economic vitality to Montpelier, to draw visitors here, to see this spectacle, to create a spectacle here that makes people want to come to Montpelier to shop and eat and dine. It's our hope that if the bridges are lit at night, people might want to stay a little longer into the evening um, when they come for an event, um, that they want to come often to see how the bridges change over time. Certainly lighting the bridges makes for greater pedestrian safety uh, throughout the city. Um, and finally, I think lighting the bridges in this town particularly celebrates our resilience uh, from current events and um, kind of celebrates the, the commitment that this town has to community and connection and building bridges. So there's a lot of potential metaphorically here and um, visually to kind of rebrand Montpelier, Montpelier as, as kind of the place to be um, through this wide-scale kind of transformation of our cityscape. So I think that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> I have kind of a basic question. Sure. What are the provisions for maintenance? Excellent. That's a great question. So built into our budgets currently, we have um, built in for throughout um, 2025 um, ongoing maintenance for all of these installations. Um, it is Montpelier Alive's commitment to build bridge lighting and the maintenance of bridge lighting and paying the electric bill into all of Montpelier Alive's budgets. So every event, every, um, every occasion, every grant that Montpelier Alive writes will include money for the bridge project. Um, and um, so it is Montpelier Alive's commitment to take care of those bridges and those installations and the electrical bill, which will be very minimal given the fact that it's L L LED lighting and it's very energy efficient. The uh, uh, my story on outdoor lighting is that they attract bugs, and the bugs attract spiders, and spiders build webs, and that can turn into a real mess. So that the whatever your installation is, it may uh, it may require cleaning. Yes. Yes. You know, maybe, maybe it's just going up there with a split broom or. A, vacuum or a leaf blower and but and what i don't know what that'll happen or not but it did it did in the operation i, I was involved with and I, 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 had, it, I hadn't heard about the bugs before but certainly the cleaning and um the maintenance is is always going to be an issue and it's um certainly part of the budgets that we have generated for this project and it's our commitment to continue to maintain those bridges that track lighting you know periodically will need to be cleaned and so as i said um, maintaining their relationship with this particular lighting company um, it's it's an ongoing relationship and we plan to secure the funding for that from year to year and to and to make that our responsibility and not the city's responsibility well, yeah, my concern is that you know nothing is well, some things are, but if something is not maintained, and it gets dirty, lights are out. Exactly. Uh, it's it's very it, it's very bad. It's like when when there was a period when Montpelier didn't really maintain the planters downtown. 
Right, right. And that was uh, was years ago, but they look so bad. Right. Uh, of course, the cool thing about lights is you can turn them off. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Um, yes, and um, you know, I, Montpelier Alive is considering lighting as an extension of their beautification budget. And so just as it funds um, the flowers downtown, it will continue to fund and care for these um, lighting installations. I, I think the idea of uh, uh, doing the Taylor Street Bridge temporarily, I, at first I said, if you're gonna do it, just do it. Uh, but I thought uh, uh, seeing what that would look like, because it's a little hard to visualize what that's going to look like. Right, right. I have some concern, Vivian, about yep. both the Taylor Street Bridge and the School Street Bridge, because there are people living very close to there, and the light effect in terms of their comfort in their own homes but you talked about this being programmable. What does that mean in terms of how long you expect these lights to be on? So first of all, the lights will all have timers, which can be adjusted seasonally, because mm -hmm. there's no point in lighting a bridge unless it's dark. Mm -hmm. And here in Montpelier, it is dark at 4.30 in November, mm -hmm. and it's dark at 9 o'clock in July. Mm -hmm. So that would all be um, programmed into the timer so that the bridges are only lit. And, and even then, um, for instance, um, when I say that the bridges will be lit in conjunction with act downtown activity. So as we talked about earlier, Bent Nails is one of the, one of the um, businesses that stays open latest. So perhaps Langdon Street would stay lit much longer than any of the Winooski um, bridges. <laughs> um, if there's not activity in downtown, if it's not part of the kind of vibrant time period in which people are coming and going and visiting and eating and going to the theater, um, the bridges do not have to be on. Mm -hmm. They can be off or they can be dimmed or um, only a few can be, uh, only, you know, some of the lights can be lit just for additional safety. What's really nice about lighting something like the Ta Taylor Street Bridge or the Main Street Bridge or the Granite Street Bridge is that it actually provides a safer way for people living on the River Street side of Montpelier to walk into town. Mm -hmm. Currently, those bridges are so dark and it's very forbidding, actually, for anyone who might want to walk into town um, just even for dinner at 7.30 or 8 o'clock at night. So we would be able to adjust that accordingly and we would be happy to take input from the community about what feels like the right amount of light and what doesn't feel like the right amount of light. The beauty of the track lighting and the programmable lighting, it you can make them softer, you can make them brighter, you can light them all up, you can light only a few of them up, you can make them different colors. So all of that, um, is, is possible within that kind of lighting system. And who's going to make the decision about when it's lit? Montpelier Alive in conjunction with the lighting company. We will have all of the, um, you know, the, the capability to change those lights, to turn them off, um, to adjust them as needed. Well, one of the suggestions I have is that you think about is setting aside money to take everything down, clean it up at the end. Um, well, so, so, that, so that the city isn't stuck with uh, a, a non-functional light system. Absolutely. Uh, the other thing that uh, uh, the system needs to be flood proof. Well, I don't think anything is really flood proof in electrical devices probably more so than others. So that that remains a risk. I mean, if the if the Langdon Street Bridge or the Rialto Bridge is underwater, those lights will be damaged. But, um, you know, if that happens, those, those lighting systems are not um, particularly expensive and are not, you know, it's not so prohibitive to replace those, should we choose to replace those. Taylor Street and Granite Street are higher and the lights would be higher, so they're less likely to be impacted in any way by flooding. 
Um, but you're, exa you're absolutely right. Um, uh, Langdon Street and School Street, for instance, are very close to the street. So those lights are vulnerable to being cut, to vandalism. We have a contract with the lighting company that they periodically visit during the times when they're installed and that they replace those lights if, those are, if they are damaged. And the track lighting system on um, the Granite Street and the Taylor Street Bridge um, will be cleaned periodically. They don't need to be taken down. They can just, they can be cleaned um, kind of on site. Uh, I have a have a few comments and questions, sure. and um, so I, I I think this is a wonderful idea. I you know I've walked into town to see the Langdon Street Bridge lit up, and I think it was in a couple of different formats. Like yeah. one was the rep, the different one that was installed. A couple of years ago, the Arts Commission lit the bridge, and um, they had a different kind of um, design for the bridge, but um, they also discovered that without sufficient electrical infrastructure, um, that uh, it was challenging to keep it um, lit and in place. But we have since installed, we have connected that bridge to the city's electrical grid, and um, we have installed um, outlets on that bridge that are now durable. We also have, um, uh, a standing relationship with the city's electrician to uh, if anything should happen to the electrical system there that they will come and service that as part of their installation yeah it seems it, it seems like a generally a, a wonderful idea um, I think that you know like every everybody well probably 90 percent of the people are very passionate about the bridges in town um, it seems like an exciting way to to coordinate with, as you said, with events. Um, you know, and to as a as a highlight, I think it, it it's an opportunity to show that you know, the Montpelier, despite being a st historic little town, has a technical sophistication that you know that matches. You know, you know, I, I drive over at this, you know, or pass by the Zaken Bridge yeah. plenty when it's when it's being being lit seasonally. So we're we're like following in these other major me metro. Uh, Politan areas. Exactly. Um, I do, you know, the, I guess one, I mean, one comment is, is that, um, that I would encourage like thinking about how, how, how the, the lighting of these things affects the perception of both the, both the, the bridge and, and the river. Um, like the wrapping, wrapping the, like wrapping the Langdon Street Bridge, it actually obscures some of the, the detail of that bridge, like how it's, you know, how it's, um, you know, the, the kind of the, the W section that it's made out of, um, and it seems like there's ways to potentially highlight that, that detail. I mean, I've, I've climbed up that bridge since I was a teenager, you know, it's, it's, I'm very, 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 very fond of it. And I, and, and also too, like having, having so many lights kind of like, you know, right in your eye level too, like, if it's and if it's coming, if it's being lit towards the street side, it can be harder to look out into the river at night. Um, you know, which is, can be really great when the moon is, you know, the moon is up, and just to get to see the, you know, the the river flowing um, there when everything's quiet. So sometimes it might be great to have it on the inside and also then switch it to the to the outside as well, because that's wonderful to see from it. You know, to be able to see from a distance. Right. Um, I live in the meadows, and so when I'm walking the dog at night, sometimes I'll see the, you know, I would see the bridge lit up down, down in um, downtown, um, and then the, so the, I guess the the question is, uh, um, you know, for j j just kind of a detailed question for the, you're talking about the Main Street Bridge and highlighting the pickets and the and the rail. Were you going to be lighting that from from above? You know, kind of what, from the handrail side down, rather yeah. than up from the street. Yes, from the handrail side down, and sort of shooting kind of sideways to kind of so that the light ricochets off of those. What did you call them? Pickets. Pickets, right? So that because the light has to hit something um, in order to show, and so it'll kind of rake those all along the edges of the bridge on both sides it's kind of creating this sort of two walls of light yeah and have you 
have you worked? I mean, I wouldn't expect you'd necessarily have this thought through yet, but the but the um, all the controls, yeah. Like, is it going to be? Um, I mean, I do work with these and coordinate these in, in buildings sometimes, and I know you can all um, you can all be kind of controlled from one computer station. I don't know with these remote sections if you have Wi-Fi capability, so that you so it's easy to, to make the to upload a change from anywhere. Yeah, um, I'm not exactly sure what the systems will be, but I have a feeling that you can probably do it from either a computer or from a potentially from a phone app. Um, yeah. That that these and you just depending on um, you know which which systems we're talking about. Some are probably a little bit more sophisticated and require a computer, and others might be a little bit um, more conducive to a phone app. But I liked yeah. what you said about the Langdon Street Bridge, and I just wanted to point out that, you know. Um, the lighting for the Taylor and the Granite Street Bridge is really designed to highlight the truss systems. So the, the Taylor Street Bridge is a Parker through truss design and the Granite Street Bridge is a Baltimore truss and the lighting there will really highlight the structure of that engineering. That was the goal for those two bridges and to have two truss bridges along the same riverway with very different truss designs and to kind of um, to illustrate that and kind of a, a line drawing and light in the in, in the dark, that was the goal there. But for Langdon Street, the for Langdon Street, where it is kind of the center of sort of the party district of town, um, focusing on the structure of that truss was less um, the objective than to call people like a beacon into that part of the city. And um, I think this year we will light it a little less. Um, a little less elaborately than we did last year. It was it was a lot last year. Um, so just having done that pilot project kind of taught us that we maybe want to take it down a notch. And then School Street would be several notches lower than that, respecting the fact that that's a res that will be very kind of um, it'll be very light and very delicate, um, but still um, echoing in some way the Langdon Street Bridge. Does that make yeah, sense? Yeah, and the, those those bridges, those two bridges certainly have the opportunity to. You can even conceal the lights within, like the the web of the structure, so that you're you're kind of washing the inside of it too. It, it sounds like that's not what you're looking for. But um, the, the, yeah, the only tricky part, um, you know, in terms of wash lights or anything in that place, is just how low those bridges are and how accessible those kinds of wash lighting systems would be to the public. So, mm -hmm. so lighting them with a more affordable lighting system, recognizing that those lights can are the most likely to get damaged, is also a consideration. But certainly, there's lots of opportunities. Nothing here is really permanent. Um, you know, I think the whole goal is that this will be an iterative process, and that perhaps in time. We might even have artists submit proposals, perhaps to light the pedestrian bridges, or to, you know, choose a bridge and have artists, you know, come up with different concepts. Um, but for right now, we're looking to um, get started with those seven key bridges downtown. And it's for, and I, I wasn't sure if the if your proposal was to. Um, and I'm sorry that I don't remember all the names of the, the bridges, but the, what you, you did show an example where there were there was um, a, a lot of like tons of individual lights on a, on a bridge. Um, right. Yeah. The, the Taylor it, Street Bridge. Can we go back to that one? Yeah. And there was too many on that one, but it, but at least it gave it was just the closest I could find to the kind of. It'll be much much more delicate on the Taylor Street Bridge. That one. This one is really encrusted, but um, if you take out all that center, all the stuff in the center, you kind of get a sense of how lacy um, that will be. The idea here is to um, do this, do the spandrel at the top and the bottom, to do the entrance and the exit, and then some of the truss, some of the diagonal trusses on the sides. So it'll be a much lighter application. One thing I would suggest is no hole drilling in the bridges. Yes, I, 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 we were, 
pretty sure that that would not happen. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we are not encouraging that either. Yeah, but ultimately, you know, if we are, as a city, if we decide we really love having our bridges lit, we do have to create durable mounting um, systems that will last. And that's kind of where I find myself now, um, you know, needing to kind of commit. We have a little bit of a time crunch in that the lighting company um, really has to install this lighting the last week in August because their holiday lighting season goes berserk starting in September. So we really have to commit to what we're going to do for 2024. So I guess, you know, one of the reasons why I'm here is to kind of get your sense about whether lighting Taylor Street temporarily and lighting Granite Street with that permanent track lighting is, um, is the way to move forward, whether we feel comfortable with that as a city. Um, so can I just interrupt real quick to throw in one little curveball? So all of the bridges except for the granite street bridge are in the design review district the granite street bridge is actually just outside of the design review district um so even if that installation were to require a zoning permit that particular one wouldn't be coming to you guys for official recommendations um but I think that, that having that one be the first one to maybe have the permanent adhesive for the programmable track lighting gives design review a chance to look at that option before the switch to having Taylor Street Bridge have that in 2025. Right, right. So it's a little, you know, and maybe it's a comeback you Just, know, next yeah. spring right. to and get we, a and review. And like I said, I, I because these are public right of way bridges, it's it's a lot. And and the exemption from needing a permit for lights because it's if it's lit for less than ninety days, whether or not design review even has jurisdiction over this is really. I don't even know if zoning has jurisdiction over most of these. So uh, yeah, on, we well. want your, you know, we wanted, I wanted to make sure that you guys got input on this because you are the experts on how to deal with a lot of these. The, on the fa fasteners, I'm sure they're clamps or they're doing such wonderful things with adhesives these days that it's fine. And, if you do adhesives and it pulls the paint off, it just has to be patched, that's all. But drilling holes is unacceptable. I agree. No argument here. <laughs> but but yeah. the proposition is to drill holes at the Rialto Bridge. No, oh yes, at the Rialto Bridge. There would need to drill, we would need to drill some holes in the Rialto Bridge, um, which and that's, I would just that's like permanent. to point out has a lot of holes. <laughs> <laughs> the, the Rialto Bridge <laughs> is going to be, that is on schedule to have some massive rework by the state. I don't remember the right. full, the exact timeline, and they keep having to adjust it because of different issues. But the Rialto Bridge is going to have the state do a ton of work on that. Right. So it will be rebuilt at some point in the next decade, regardless. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think go for the, go, I would say go for the permanent. It's going to be it's going to be a, a, a better, cleaner installation. It's going to you know you're it's going to be less of an approximation. Um, I just think it's going to have a much better impact. I'm in what's the general schedule because uh, I think easing into this and seeing how the public reacts is a good thing. I don't know. I can't remember. You've talked about what six bridges. Seven in total. Seven, okay. Right. I think kind of easing into it, Langdon Street is an obvious one. Uh, right. And the Rialto, I think, is a good obvious one. And, you know, I do want to just say that we did spend much of 2023 talking to business owners, historians, naturalists, um, the city itself 
Um, we brought as many people as we could into this conversation, shared our thoughts on these designs, talked about the bridges and their significance for the town and the history of the town. Um, so we feel like we've had a lot of community input and it's just um, extremely positive. Um, so we feel like we have that relationship. Um, I think in terms of, we have a team of naturalists and historians who are trying to raise awareness about the importance of Montpelier's bridges as part of this project. Um, so we're going to do an installation in the Walgreens window on the histories of our bridges and our watershed. There'll be walking tours. And when the bridges are lit in November, we hope to have a big community celebration with a lantern parade. So the idea is to bring as many people under this umbrella as possible. We don't want this project to be a surprise for anyone. Um, and we hope that bringing attention to the bridges also kind of keeps us focused on our rivers and the work that we need to do um, for our town um, with our watershed. I, I thought, uh was something I, I was involved in from a historic preservation point of view uh, working on bridges for years and have you checked with anybody at AOT to see about made their maintenance schedule painting or any other maintenance work they need to do on these bridges we're in conversation and, yeah. with Zach and DPW about that about yeah, I think, that relationship I think, yeah I think you need to talk not with necessarily with DPW, but with the AOT bridge program because the AOT does most of the, virtually all the planning for any major work on the bridges, whether it's Taylor Street or Granite Street. Okay. Ben, you've been trying to hop <laughs> in. I mean, clearly you've put a lot of thought into this and I appreciate your, um your artistic kind of efforts and not making them all the same and making them all be have opportunities for doing different things and uh, I think it's a really fantastic idea I'm curious just what we need to decide tonight like what is this purely informational and but it sounds like there's something you you're planning to move hopeful well, I, to move uh, forward with something in August. You know, I, I feel that, you know, when we're talking about yeah, in, in spite of all my questions, hold, hold, I think hold on, hold on, Eric. I, I don't know if you could hear that um, Vivian was talking. Hold on right. a second. You know, before oh. I, you know, would feel comfortable or Montpelier Alive would feel comfortable um, endorsing putting bolts into the Rialto Bridge or putting adhesive on the uh, Greenwich Street Bridge. I just wanted to talk to as many people as possible and um, just make sure that we're all feeling good about that. Um, yeah, so that's really that, why I'm here and that, that's where my time constraint comes in. If you all feel comfortable with that, then I feel sort of more comfortable moving forward and endorsing that plan. In, in spite of all my questions, I think it's a very interesting idea. Thank you. It's not, there's not a permit application before me because so far none of, none of these projects have actually triggered over into needing a zoning permit. Um, and I actually, I need to go talk to my state people as to whether or not some of these even need flood hazard permits, even though they're technically in the floodways. It's not expanding like a structure or anything. It's these minimal light attachments where it's it's not going to add anything new to obstruct floodwaters so i don't even know if it needs any permits from me at all well i, I, I greatly I, appreciate your presentation and your thoughtfulness about all the bridges and the ways of going about this and built a lot of trust with me about what how moving forward and i'm all for drilling holes in the Rialto Bridge and putting stickers on the uh, <laughs> Thank you. other one. And, you know, moving forward, I think Montpelier Alive just really wants yeah, I, to... I appreciate you coming to Design Review with this with, for our ideas. Well, thanks for having me. And moving forward, I think we want to remain in dialogue with you folks and with the Arts Commission and make sure that this all feels really unified and, and, um, and, uh, and, and an expression of what we all kind of see for our town. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's a great idea.
Next up uh, is review and approval of meeting minutes from 7 1. Has everybody had a chance to review those minutes? I have, and I'll make a motion to accept them the way they're written. Do we this have a Martha? second? I'll second that, please. Great. I'm going to abstain because I wasn't there. Same here. That's okay. Do we have enough? Yep. Just three. myself, three? Yep. Uh, we have a, a vote to accept the minutes? This is Martha. I say yes. Liz, yes. And I say yes. Great. Minutes are approved. Any other business? Nope. Just that we've got our, the next regular meeting isn't until August 19th. So. Got a got a bit of a summer break ahead yeah. of you. Nice. Will we have a parklet in front of the <laughs> bent nails by then? Probably not. You don't think so? Well, because they've got to fabricate it all, so it's gonna take it's gonna take a little time to build it. I think. I I would love it if they could do that, but they also they still have to get they still have to get the approval from the city manager, mm -hmm. right? So this is your recommendation goes to the city manager's office, um, but they're you know getting input from several different departments. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. And I'll second it. All in favor of adjournment? Martha? Aye. Liz. Liz. And Ben. That's everybody. I heard William. Okay. <laughs> Meeting is adjourned. Yay. Thank you all.